Um, I will call to order the meeting for Monday, December 7th, 2020. Select board meeting. Um, there was a agenda that was sent out. Carla, was that today? Well, it was posted Saturday, but I neglected to send you all a copy. So there's one additional item on the agenda. So hopefully everyone has it and we'll catch it if, if not. Um, I yeah. believe I have it in front of me. Um, so first thing, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda or anyone would like to add anything? I would like to, one thing, well, I make a motion to approve the agenda as, as presented. And I also, based upon today's the 79th uh, anniversary of Pearl Harbor, give thanks to all, uh, put in the minutes, give thanks to all of our veterans on this day. Can I get a second? I'll second, second that one. Any further discussion? Who seconded that? Uh, Chris, I believe. Chris. I was looking. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent agenda items, minutes from November 16th meeting and errors and omissions letter dated December 3rd, 2020. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Looks like we do have a couple members of the public. I don't know if anyone on the call would like to speak. Can I make a comment, please? Sure. So Ken Bellavo, Chair of the Planning Commission. Um, a somewhat related item to the Planning Commission, I wanted to take this opportunity to congratulate Alyssa Johnson on her new job and to just say publicly what an outstanding job she did in terms of attending our meetings, which are not always the most exciting. Um, I know it's a surprise to everyone, but uh, uh, you know, Alyssa did a great job and uh, I wanna congratulate her on her getting her new uh, her new opportunity, and we will miss you. Thank you very much, Ken. And I, I agree. I think uh, you're going to be missed, Alyssa, and good luck with your, your new gig. Um, anything else from the public? And we'll move on to select board items, update on draft unified development bylaws and timeline for approval. Who would you like to address? Um, is Steve on the call? Yeah, I'm, I'm right here, Mark. Um, so I both I, Ken, Ken and I yeah, are. You, yeah, I wasn't sure. Typically, I think Steve kind of drives, but Ken, if, if you want to speak to it, um, I believe this was added on out of my request because I was in a DRB meeting um, last week, and there's some discussion on, you know, there is a specific project that's looking to come into town that is struggling to navigate our our current zoning regs and I think a lot of it has to do with just when they were written and some of the, the newer businesses like breweries aren't necessarily clearly defined in there especially microbreweries so you know one of the comments was well we've been asking the select board to do this for five years and I know it's been a lot of work has been done and I was just hoping to, I know we have some new members that haven't been on since, you know, the only on since April. And I know we've talked about it from time to time, but I was wondering if we could get an update tonight and talk about a timeline. Sure, let, let me uh, try to address it uh, at least briefly. Um, <clears throat> so the Planning Commission has been working on this uh, comprehensive rewrite of the town's development regulations for, um, I think I may still have had hair when we started. Uh, that's how long ago it was. Um, it seems like it was that long ago, although it wasn't quite that far. But um, suffice it to say that even with the absence of all of what's transpired in the last year with COVID-19, it has been a painfully slow process. Um, uh, and, and I think there's a variety of reasons for it. One is the enormity of the scope of the project is very, very big. Um, and to that end, one of the things that we've tried to do in the last few months is to sort of to whittle it down 
rather than trying to tackle the whole town all at once to um, focus more on the, the village downtown area, if you will, in the interest of uh, number one, getting something accomplished because we were spending a lot of time and not really getting anywhere. Um, you know, we, we had uh, some interruption because of, you know, the COVID-19 stuff and we have been meeting in person up until recently. Now we're, we're Zooming like you folks are. Um, that no doubt will slow things down further. So um, that's where we are. And I, and I looked at the agenda and it, it sort of suggested, you know, what was the timeline? And, um, you know, it's like, God only knows. Um, it's, it's very slow, it's a very slow process. Part of it is also, other than what I've already offered, <clears throat> is that, you know, the planning commission is made up of lay people who, other than myself, don't really have a lot of background. And uh, I would, I think suffice it to say, they've taken their charge very seriously and they want to understand things really well before saying I'm okay with this and I'm okay with that. Um, <clears throat> that causes things to move, move very slowly. Um, what I would say, and I pose this as a question to the board, is that if there's a particular part of all that where the select board would wants to say, here's where we want you to hone in, um, that might, I can't guarantee anything, but that might help, uh, you know, the planning commission to, you know, to stay focused on task. But um, it, it has been a very, very slow process, uh, Mark, that's, that's, that's the way it's been. Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Sure, Ken, I'll just add a little bit. I think you outlined it really well. Um, I think um, one of the challenges with any zoning is to find areas where there's consensus. And one of the things that the Planning Commission discovered when we were dealing with rural areas is that there wasn't necessarily good consensus, especially among landowners, in terms of how to deal with rural density. I think we're gonna find a different uh, dynamic with the village areas because uh, especially when it comes to density and, and I think uses as well to some extent. And um, in fact, at the last meeting, we talked about the downtown district, which um, is currently the downtown commercial district and had a, a fairly lengthy discussion about uh, breweries, interestingly enough. Um, but um, I think we're gonna find that this is an area where we can build consensus. Uh, we have a meeting on uh, January 11th with the Planning Commission and a fellow named Jake Hemmerich with the state. The state has put out an excellent publication called uh, Enabling Better Places that uh, really focuses on how to develop <laughs> village areas appropriately and downtown areas and so on. So. One of the missions of the state, interestingly enough, is to encourage planning commissions to break down their amendments into workable um, pieces that can move forward. So, so we're going to specifically talk to, uh, to Jake about um, their recommendations on, on how to do that. So to me, that's very encouraging and um, we'll really need some guidance I think uh, maybe a joint meeting with the select board at some point where to, to discuss uh, you know, where there's good agreement and where we can move a piece of these uh, zoning amendments forward uh, effectively. So, and I, I think that the village areas, the downtown area is one area that um, we can focus on. So Mary has joined the call and Mary is a champion of, uh, <laughs> of promoting density in the village areas. So um, Mary can introduce the topic and I just added about our meeting with Jake, Jake Hemmerich and moving a piece of this forward. So uh, um, Mark, is it all right if Mary gets a chance here to add? Yeah, absolutely. You're on mute, Mary. You're still on mute. You're on mute. 
Um, having missed the introduction and the, um, you know, Ken and Steve gave and the question other than you wanted an update, I understand about our progress. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna sort of wait to hear a little more of the discussion and some questions. Yeah, Mary, I think uh, most of it had to do with a conversation in the DRB meeting about um, an issue with a permit and use and potentially the use that was is brewery and the definition of that in our zoning regs. Um, Alyssa maybe can speak to a couple of projects I've heard of about hair salons not being able to be on Main Street or in some of the, you know, so there's, there's definitely some uses that over the years um, people have applied for and run into issues with maybe zoning that just isn't up you know, doesn't have all the uses or for some reason had decisions that I think a lot of us could agree that, you know, a hair salon could go into the eye care building that's down on Main Street. But, and I think Alyssa currently has a, another hair care place that is struggling to find a place, uh, two, two hair care places. We, 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 wow. So, um, you know, and that's the question. And I'm glad to hear that there might be an opportunity that we can take this in kind of chunks and move some of it forward. I think um, I know that taking the whole thing on is is, uh, is of great magnitude, but I, I would hate to think that we have projects that are trying to move forward and running into um, some of the work that, you know, the work that you're already doing that might help some of these projects move forward easily and not run into some of the headaches and ultimately costs or loss of business or you know, anything like that. So I was hoping just tonight to understand any kind of timeline and, and now hearing that there might be an opportunity to break it apart, you know, just letting us know what that timeline might look like and how it might come to the board. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately every year we have turnover of some select board usually. So I think not all of us know exactly what changes are coming. And, and I think that would be important to keep us in the loop there. And I know that you've asked for some select board members to attend your meetings. And I think that's gonna be important as well. I, I, I think the um, municipal plan currently supports are looking at more density and across kind of the um, continued livable downtown idea that we wanna promote. And we've had a lot of discussions um, about how to do that responsibly and, you know, the balance between um, business and residents. And there are currently three planning commission me members who live in what was the former village area. So we, we each bring a slightly different take on things, but um, I, I think, um, you know, all five of us recognize that finding balance is really our biggest challenge and you know it's it one of the things that the select board members may want that I've been thinking about since this came up for tonight may want to do is look at the map revisions that we are considering for you know um, the downtown area because we're we are looking at some changes which would affect this potential uh, brewery location and um, my, you know, my understand, you know, right, right. We, we tried to create boundaries and it's not finalized, but it certainly creates, a, in my mind, makes a little more sense than what currently exists that, um, you know, one use is allowed, you know, I don't, I'm, I don't know how many steps, but just around the corner from a place where the same use is not allowed in the downtown area. So we're, we're trying to clean up those kind of things. And I think it would be really helpful because we've we've been down this road before as those of you that have been on the select board for a while know that we pulled together what we think is the most responsible recommendations for the select board and then there's not the will to support it. So the more input we have now, the better we're gonna be able to be in alignment with what you might be looking for. So. Those are a couple of my thoughts. Bill, uh, I talked to Bill this week too, and Bill, you had mentioned that conversation surrounding 
um, zoning that focuses more on look than use as well. Um, I'm blanking on the terminology right now, but I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that. I know I've brought it up in the past. Um, I think it's form-based zoning. Um, and I know that there's been some feedback from the planning commission that they didn't want to pursue that, but I, I just feel I'm, I've sat in a couple of DRB meetings recently just because of the one project on Foundry and then the one um, there on, on Stowe Street and just the, 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 what the DRB is kind of making applicants go through in terms of floor plans and trying to say that the breakdown of, uh, you know, space is, is representative of the use and how, and you know, what the primary use is. I just, um, I fear that sometimes we're not maybe talking about as much as what's happening on the exterior of these buildings. And I see some projects that have gone up that, you know, I would say could have been architecturally done better and the focus there and making, you know, creating value in, in historic look versus some of this use conversation, I feel like could be as or more important. And I, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that again as an idea. And I didn't know if you could do it where that's just the downtown or, or what your thoughts are on that. Well, yeah, I think, I think Ken and Steve probably are in a better position to describe form-based zoning than, than I am, but I think you're on the right track that it does um, focus less on the uses and more on what the structures look like and how they relate to other, uh, other development in the particular area. Um, I, I agree with what Mary said a minute ago that um, the current bylaws that we have and the current um, plan that um, that informs those bylaws, uh, you know, you have these, it's okay to do this here on Stowe Street and or not on Stowe Street, but right down the street where I could throw a rock from one building to the other, uh, it's okay. And I, I think that's really uh, the challenge that we have. Um, I, I don't know a lot about form-based zoning and I don't really know what its definition is. And when I suggested that that is something that might be looked at. Uh, I'm not sure that it hasn't been already by the Planning Commission, so I would defer to them on it. But I, I do want to take this quick opportunity to, to let you know that the current situation is not a happy situation for anyone right now. The Planning Commission has been doing a lot of work. Uh, they're all lay people, as Ken said, and it takes a lot of time. It's a pretty daunting task that they're undertaking, and now COVID has made that more difficult. Um, the DRB and the zoning administrator, frankly, they have to live as well as the developers do with the regulations that we have right now. And I think that's where the, the rub really is, is there's a lot, I get, I get a number of calls from people. I see Jason is on here. Uh, but not just from Jason. His, his project was the subject of the DRB meeting last week, but a number of developers um, uh, call me. Alyssa talks to me um, uh, about can't the zoning and planning staff be a little bit more flexible and, and help people a little bit more throughout through this process. And from my position, I don't see them as as choosing to be unhelpful. But when, when you have a use table and you have to make a determination, all right, this is the use that's being applied for. Is it allowable in this district or not? And if it, if it isn't, and that's the case that we found ourselves in last week, that the zoning administrator determined that the use being applied for was not uh, permitted in the district. She can't just send it to the DRB and say, well, this looks like a good project, figure it out. She has to deny it. And then that, you know, that initiates an appeal and it's a quasi-judicial, uh, somewhat adversarial process because now the applicant has to tell, has to get the DRB to come to a place where they say, well, the zoning administrator's decision was wrong. It really is allowable. So, uh, we're, we're kind of in a tough place right now, and we're in a tough time where people who have 
um, invested in properties, especially in the downtown, they see narrow opportunities to get something done, to get a building uh, filled with tenants, to get a business up and running so that they have a chance to make it. And I think there's a lot of feeling on everyone's part and Steve's on the call. I think from staff's position, there's a, a big feeling that we're just being, that we're hamstrung right now, especially in, in this downtown district that uh, the, the use table is a bit antiquated, I guess, out of date. So I was glad to hear Steve and Ken both talk about where they are in the process. And maybe I missed something, but Ken, is it possible to, to uh, concentrate on one particular district and then you know bring those uh, bylaws to the select board for, for a hearing and, and adopt this in series, or does it all have to be done together? And I don't know if it's, you know, whether it's possible, if, if something can be possible, but it almost, it might not feel right either. So A, is it possible? And B, is, is that, does that make sense? Well, so the, to answer the last part of the question, um, is it possible? There's five members of the Planning Commission. If we can count to three <clears throat> on any individual question, then it becomes possible. So that's, uh, that's the first challenge. Um, that was really what I had suggested. I think it was last summer when I said, let's focus on something and let's break it up. Because, you know, we were, we started with this whole big, it was a big picture sort of thing. And then we were out, uh, we were out in the more rural part of town. And, you know, as Steve alluded to earlier, um, it was clear that there was there was not a consensus and there was we were getting significant pushback from property owners and it, it looked to me and I think the commission agreed that we were kind of stalling out we weren't getting anywhere and that's where I had suggested that if we were to focus more in the downtown area the village area um, that we we might be able to more easily reach some agreement um, some consensus uh, and 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 part of that in the interest of getting something accomplished because you know, just spending a lot of time on this project and not having anything to show for it, it's, it's not very gratifying. So um, I, I would I'd also address one of the earlier uh, questions you raised, Bill, and Mark as well alluded to uh, form-based zoning or what's sometimes called a form-based code. Um, <clears throat> what was prepared by the consultant um, has what I would call some form-based elements in it, which in a downtown area is, is, is really the most appropriate place for that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't think I would call it a form-based code per se, but it has some form-based elements in it. And um, so, you know, that's part of what we're trying to deal with in the downtown area is trying to make it simpler trying to make it more workable, but at the same time, we also don't want to make a lot of what's already there non-conforming. Um, so you get a lot of different things that are going on because you know, you've, you've got this historic design pattern that exists in the downtown area and, and that's not gonna go away anytime soon. And I, and I, and I think that's a good thing. Um, that being said, it does present uh, some challenges. Um, I, I don't know what Mary's thought is on this, but my thought is that, that I, I find this discussion to be helpful and, you know, we can bring this back to the commission and say, we had this conversation with the select board and, and let's see if we can focus and try to get something done. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I would just reiterate what I said before that the, the map and what we're defining as the downtown, it would be nice to know that the select board is on board or if they're not on board, what is it that they would like to see different? Because that helps also for us to take a chunk. It's not just what the bylaws are gonna say in terms of allowable development in the area, but do we have the boundaries in a way that we're gonna get support for it? Because it, it 
it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And we ran into this with the uh, flood hazard regulations that, you know, people who weren't completely flooded in Irene were now in a zone that they were regulated by the realities of what happens with um, our floodplain. So that would be the only thing I would ask in advance of us as a planning commission, bringing it back to the full commission to say, do we want to just complete this one um, zoning district and what's allowable and propose that. I think the boundaries, some agreement or consensus or go ahead with the way we're looking at it would be important. Go ahead, Chris. Yep, go ahead, Chris. A couple of questions here. I mean, whenever we get into zoning regs and economic development issues, it's always a uh, tough issue to, <laughs> to negotiate. Um, my first question is, is there any state legislative time frame for rewrites and how would uh, fragmenting the process taking for certain pieces of this uh, play into that if you're supposed to meet some process, some legislative deadline for a complete rewrite? Uh, and my other concern for fragmenting the process, not to say that it can't be done, is continuity um, in the entire process. Um, I think you need to, when you're, when you're taking a look at certain aspects of regulations, you kind of have to reflect on other parts of town and their zoning districts as well. Uh, and then as far as the form-based type regulation system, um, my concern with that would be, you know, similar issues like, kind of like I've got next door where you've taken a fairly quiet restaurant and turned it, turned it into what some people might consider a slash nightclub. Um, you'd have to be careful that that didn't, continue to migrate beyond the limits of reason on certain areas. I'll stop there. Go ahead, Stephen and Mike. Yeah, uh, just to answer a couple of your questions, Chris, uh, in terms of the time frame, uh, there are two options. One is the, the conventional review and approval process for zoning bylaws. and. That is the same for a small group of bylaws versus a comprehensive unified development bylaw. The Planning Commission has to hold uh, at least one public hearing, then they forward a draft to the select board. Select board um, has to hold a public hearing. And um, the other option is interim bylaws. Uh, we've, uh, you, the select board has approved two sets of interim bylaws, as, as I think you'll recall for uh, first signs uh, relating to Main Street reconstruction and then for the tents for dining and our rec program. And that's an expedited process where um, there is more of an emergency situation and um, the COVID um, pandemic is certainly uh, that context. So, so, the so zoning bylaws can, can move through in either fashion. Um, I think with interim bylaws, we want to make sure that um, there's there's some consensus around whatever is being done, and um, you know we've we've done that a number of times. After Irene, we passed uh, a couple sets of interim bylaws as well. So the planning commission can talk about options. I think for how to move a piece of this forward, I would be glad to send the select board the map um, and have you take a look at the village area and try to do some explaining about that. Um, but I think it'll be, it would be good if the Planning Commission has a chance to talk, uh, they meet uh, next Monday about um, kind of how, how, to, how to respond and how, how to move, um, move this forward. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, sorry, Mike, I think I said you were next and then Bill, unless you're gonna speak specifically to Steve, Bill. Well, I just wanna uh, try to, I think, specifically answer Chris's question. 
the, the only legislative mandate that I'm aware of with regard to uh, the town plan is that they have to be reauthorized every so many years. It used to be five, I'm not sure if it's seven or whatever it is now. I, d I don't think the process of, uh, of kind of updating the uh, bylaws on a, on a, uh, in a, in series is any kind of problem. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you can adopt it now. Um, it, when you get the next one done, you can, you, you can readopt the first one and that one at that time. And by the end, when you're finished, you just adopt everything. So I, I don't think that's an issue at all. And as far as continuity is concerned, I agree with you, but I think Ken kind of spoke to that already, that just in the process that we're in, there's a, a number of new people on the planning commission, there's new select board members, and you know that happens all the time, and we just have to kind of live with that. So I, I don't think that's a big issue. Mike, I think next. Yep. Um, I too want have spoken to Bill about this issue. It, it to me, it's 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 frustrating. I know I was on the DRB for many years. Nat can relate to this. Um, I was always frustrated about things that were out of our control because they were in zoning. Uh, you know, applicants would complain about some issues, and we couldn't do anything. This is what zoning said. So. I'm not pointing any fingers, but I think something has to be done in a reasonably short term. And maybe the way, as Steve said, is through some interim zoning bylaws. Uh, we just have to, you know, for the sake of economic development, and especially we're in an era of COVID, you know, there's going to be a lot of things to hopefully keep our town sustainable that we're gonna lose projects to different municipalities if we don't streamline some of the and existing problems. And I think as a, a few have mentioned, probably the downtown is, is probably the place to start. I know it would be nice to be have a comprehensive, but if we could have some sort of interim by, bylaw changes that we could deal with some of the very distinct downtown issues that would help a more livable downtown as well as uh, create some economic vitality. But I think ultimately, you know, I, I, I think at least I'm gauging from what I'm hearing from the select board members that there's will to get something done. And, you know, it's a matter of us sitting down with the planning commission and or the DRB and let's work something out and get something out there and, you know, you know, hopefully we could get some change. We're, we're not creating any new districts, correct? There's some work on boundary relocation. I understand the density conversation, but within each one of those, there's the map change, but is there, are there any new zoning areas to be added or is it just border yeah. movement? I think what we were looking to do, uh, Mark, was actually to reduce the number of districts and, and at, the, at the simplest level, you know, there's no longer a split between the town government and the village government. We used to have two governments, right? So we used we literally had two sets, two sets of zoning districts because you had you had zoning districts that had the word village in them. Well, that you know that distinction no longer exists. So that was one of the things that we were trying to do. But we were trying. Uh, part of our objective was to try to simplify um, rather than. Uh, complicate as much as we possibly could. We, we, we do have some new districts and we have some combined districts. We have some changed boundaries. That's why the map is, it's not just what the bylaws say, but it's looking at the map as it, in the draft. So you, so use table couldn't be the first focus because the use table will involve newly named districts correct so you couldn't really do it that way well we've we've looked at a new draft of a use table in conjunction with i mean there and and i'm just talking off the top of my head but there are like three different aspects that go into the use table there are definitions of what those uses are there are um districts 
and what's allowable in a district, what's conditional in a district. And the, the third issue is sort of the overall plan that governs you know, what, what the goal is, if you will. So it's, it's layered. If, I don't know if Ken or Steve could say it a little more succinctly, but that's how I see it. I think that's where really the update needs is on some of the uses versus maybe where the districts are and mapping has to change some of the definitions of they're, what, they're, what use. They're interlocking, Mike. I, I understand. Okay. I have a little bit of a planner's background. Right, right. But I, but I, it, I, we've tried to pull out, we, we worked through the use table and we have some, I think some real um, promising recommendations for how it can be changed, but we haven't refined it because we're now looking at each district and saying, okay, is that what we really want? Is that what we mean? And we're finding, you know, cross-referencing things. So it's not as simple as just taking a table and marking it up a little bit. I just don't, I don't want us to suggest that we, we, we're trying to do this responsibly and I don't want to suggest that it could be, oh, let's right. just take the table and make some revisions, that's all. Right, but that's where I'm kind of seeing is that we, we were kind of at this four or five years ago, you know, looking at this and we need something to bring our town forward now. And I'm not, I, that's why I'm seeing is maybe that's where, as Steve presented, some sort of an interim bylaw might be a way to go to get something at least on the table and moving and then moving from, you know, interim to, you know, then we could look at comprehensive bylaw change. Maybe I'll just speak briefly to this. Um, the one district, interestingly enough, that hasn't changed dramatically is the downtown district. Uh, the main change is that we've taken some of the um, industrial pockets like the end of Foundry Street, um, the area where um, Evercopy had e the Eagle Oil uh, Depot. Uh, there are a couple pockets of industrial industrially zoned area and we've incorporated those into the downtown district and then added some of the um, limited industrial uses into the downtown district. So I think if we were to think about any area that that might be suitable for something in an interim, that that might be an option. I think the Planning Commission is going to have to talk about that and see if that would be workable. Um, but once you get beyond that, the, the, the Unified Development Bylaw really strives to reorganize districts, simplify districts, and add um, add residential density in some of the areas and more flexibility. But um, yeah, I think this will take some further conversation and then maybe a, some kind of a proposal back to the select board uh, on, on what might be done in an interim basis. Interim bylaws are a little tricky, but uh, they've served us well, I think, in the times when, when they've been well thought out and um, have been able to move forward. Les, uh, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know you've been working on this quite a bit as well and kind of been interacting with a lot of the um, groups trying to do business in town and wondering if you have any thoughts before we we see you depart on Friday. Um, well, belated thanks to you and Ken um, for the kind words. It's kind of serendipitous. I joke so. Um, a reporter calls me year from Vermont Business Magazine and says, you know, what's happening in Waterbury? And in October 2017, three months into my job, I said, we're doing a zoning rewrite. It's going to be so great. <laughs> it's really good for the community. Um, Maddie Hughes, then working for the Waterbury Record, wrote about how it's going to be like writing a cookbook and we were going to do the different levels. And so, you know, it's something I've definitely jumped in with both feet. And I give a lot of credit to Ken and Mary and Steve and the Planning Commission for um, trying to work with everyone. I think I echo the point a lot of folks have made here about figuring out what we can get over the finish line and sooner rather than later. Um, you know, I know I'm as much a part of the complication and the reason this process takes a long time because we do want to get it right for all the different stakeholders and businesses that may have contacted me. Um, you know, that being said, I think the group has really stepped up with these interim regulations and saying, okay, this needs to happen soon and gotten something to you all and you've gotten it done. 
I think similar to you, Mark and Jason, I've done a lot of interacting recently. There's also some things that just need to get cleaned up and like our local regulations don't meet state statute for how long you need to notice a hearing. You know, three sets of town staff had noted that it's it's no one's fault and they're really good in your communication about saying you need to warn this 15 days ago, but why do our regs say 10 days and it's been however many years. So I think I'm encouraged by this conversation and seeing what the select board and other people can work to get something passed quickly. And I know that the, you know, Mary, others have spoken to things are so intermingled. So I know defining uses and districts is harder. Um, I will say, Steve, I think we're extending the downtown a little because I'm laughing. There's an available space for a hair salon in South Main Street, but it's over the illustrious Park Row dividing line. So can't be a hair salon. And it's hard to explain. And again, there's a million examples, but I would say my takeaway, if there is any, is figure out what can we break up in terms of both easy fixes, because I do think there's some admin cleanup and Yes, it doesn't make sense to do that if we're gonna have new zoning regulations next year, but that's what I said in 2017. Um, so I think figuring out what can get over the finish line and maybe it's adding a new definition, maybe it's focusing on the downtown um, would be great to see because I understand again, as folks have said, no one's really happy, but I think the select board and the planning commission talking more and getting some things fixed sooner would be great. Did anybody else want to say something? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, this is it. Uh, well, I served on the old planning commission and the DRB, uh, and I agree. It's very complicated in the village, and. I mean, there's the historic district on top of the business district on top of, on top of, on top of. And if some of that can be clarified, I think that would be wonderful uh, because people get confused. And I know it's difficult, <laughs> it's not easy. And I applaud all your work on it because I know what it's like. I've been there, done that. Mark, one last thing. Yep, go ahead. Um, thinking about this whole thing, if you think back in history of the town of Waterbury, the village especially had a lot of different aspects of different types of businesses, everything from a plywood mill to a cannery to a furniture manufacturing facility uh, to CCC camps here, here in the village. Um, so redrafting zoning regs when Mike said something to the fact of uh, bringing our town forward, <laughs> I think that's going to be an ever endless uh, story because, you know, times change, businesses change. Uh, and I won't, you know, no ill words here, but I think it's the squeaky wheel scenario that drives a lot of this because until somebody comes to the table looking do something that might be outside the normal box of the regulations. Regulations stand at the current time fairly, fairly good. Um, and it's an until somebody is trying to push, you know, either into a different area based on available space or demographics or some other scenario that drives them to want to put a business somewhere where we don't qualify it as being right now then the burden falls in the lap of the planning commission and the DRB to work out this, you know, um, this urgency to try to make changes. And, you know, I've said it right along forever that one, the good, the one funny thing, I wouldn't even call it good about human beings is typically when we don't like something or something doesn't suit us very well, uh, we always change it. We always change it to suit ourselves. Um, some manner and sometimes it's not always to uh to the benefit of the planet per se but uh i commend the planning commission and the drb for all their efforts and the zoning administrator and, and you know steve you you as well um it, it's an ever endless changing job and um i wouldn't i wouldn't put your shoes on for a minute 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree to some of that, Chris, but I think, you know, just watching the conversation surrounding this project on Stowe Street that's trying to go into that new building, you know, referring to a microbrewery as a canning facility or a bottling facility or bottling plant, to me, I, I would be surprised if I went to the Planning Commission and they agreed that that was the right definition. So I think that's where there are some businesses, I think we saw the success of the Alchemist and as they struggled to find growth um, in an area, a town that allowed for it, or, you know, unfortunately had sewer connection, um, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to have to review. And then I, I remember having a conversation with uh, the woman who bought the building for the eye care facility right there on Park Row and, and her friend had the hair salon where Blackback is now. And they had no idea that a hair salon wasn't allowed one street over. And she left her lease on Main Street thinking she could go down Main Street and found out that she couldn't put her hair salon in that building. So there are some real implications to some of this that I really think is causing quite a bit of, of, of grief and headache just because of some things that could be changed and I think are going to be changed in these new regs. And you know, hearing about two more hair salons today is another example of where I think we do need to just start to say, okay, let's let's start moving stuff forward, and and we can't sit on this any longer. And I agree that this is the this is, I think we're fortunate to have a town that has not a lot of available commercial space, but it, our, our strength is only in, you know, our process and and all of these regs. And I think that they if if we have businesses that can't figure out how to do business here and they go elsewhere. That's, you know, ultimately going to hurt our values and development moving forward, even smart development and brand list value and supply demand. So I think that we really do have to take it seriously. And, and if we know that there are some things that need to be addressed, we need to address them as soon as we can. So Chris, you had, you had made, you had made a comment about a squeaky wheel. And um, back when Mike Bard and I were sitting on the DRB some three odd years ago, Mr. Wolf came and was very animated um, at one of our DRB hearings because um, there was a, a pretty blatant miscommunication between the administration and you know a perspective, somebody who was just really wanting to get a business started downtown. And well, he's still sitting here. <laughs> you know, he's, he's still in front of us. He's, he's going squeak, squeak, squeak. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a case in point and I, and I have no doubt, you know, I've been on the DRB. I have not been on the planning commission, but you know, they're, they're, it's a, it's a hard job and it's a hard job to muddle through all those details. Um, but, you know, for somebody like Jason, who's, just saying, hey, I just I I just want to get something done here. Um, I think we owe it to these people that want to get these businesses going downtown. That we need to fast track some of this stuff. And and if there's any way that we can help, if there's anything we can do, I'm in. I I I'd just like to say thank you, and I completely agree, Chris. I have spent a little bit of time, not a lot, with with a number with Mary and with Ken and with you, Chris, and with, with Steve on the Planning Commission. And, and I fully appreciate the challenges and, 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 I, and, I, and I don't mean to critique anybody, but it is frustrating because I, I see a ton of opportunity for Waterbury. Um, and we are, I mean, we're, we, we wanna build, you know, we wanna invest and, and make nice uh, things that I think will be attractive to, as, as Steve said, you know, Th there should be a collaboration. I think most people will agree that they will support the types of projects uh, that we're, we were talking about. I and mean, the one Nat brought up was uh, an office space on um, uh, on Main Street, just across the street from the municipal offices, which I, I think was consistent with uh, development. And uh, and again, I just I thank you all for the time you're taking to, to talk about this. It, it means a lot. Yeah, I don't want people to misunderstand me. I'm just trying to explain the, the, the need for these changes is through change in business, through, through entrepreneurship, through uh, desire to 
you know, start a business in a town and, and typically, especially in Vermont, where we're kind of like small town still. Uh, and in the past, you've kind of made it through with whatever businesses were there. But there's always a, a new set of shoes walking through the door with, with some other idea that doesn't fit the book that we've written. Uh, and unfortunately, usually time is of the essence. And uh, so it's difficult for the planning commission and the, and the whole process to react, you know, in a split second. Um, but yet I understand what you said, Nat, about Jason being here for three years, but. Uh, well, but to that point, and, and this will be the last thing that I say, and I don't want to show any disrespect to what Mark or Alyssa are talking about with the hair salon, but you know, it's one thing uh, to suggest that maybe a, a business isn't properly defined and what Jason is trying to do with the beer folk is not a cannery and a brewery. That kind of thing is understandable, but I really don't think that we need to take responsibility when somebody gives up a lease on place A to move to place B, when it's pretty clear if she just asked the question before it happens that we would have said no. It might not be reasonable that it's no, but when it's no, the, the applicant needs to take the, the initiative to ask and not just say, oh boy, the town is really sticking it to us. Uh, the regulations, whatever they are, are the regulations and you gotta deal with them and if it doesn't fit, to deal with the process, but the the hair salon thing, while I don't disagree that it should be changed, the fact that it's hung some people up and hung some people maybe out to dry isn't our fault. Could I say something? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Um, I what I love about Waterbury and being part of whatever process to kind of. Uh, continue to support our town and grow our town and keep our town the way it is all at the same time, um, is that, that thoughtful, responsible people like those who are have spoken tonight um, demonstrate is what's really helpful. And in the long run, I think good decisions are made. I, what I would say though, in my time on the planning commission, which I've lost track of how long it was, um, sometime after Irene, one of the things that that's difficult, and it goes to the squeaky wheel comments. There have been times when, either coming to the planning commission or public hearings or to the select board, there have been um, individuals who want to do something that is a little outside of you know all of what we've been talking about, and there've been attempts to try to see what could be done to support those individuals. And what I would really love, you know, and sometimes that's made things better. Sometimes it's, it hasn't quite frankly, you know, there were some, there was a big squeaky wheel for, I'll go back to the flood hazard regulations where, um, I don't know, Steve would remember, but 20 feet instead of, 22 feet or something. It, it wasn't, you know, there was going to be a business that was going to come into town and it is, um, you know, if, if the regulations are the way they're proposed, then that business will never come. And so the select board moved in the direction of that squeaky wheel and that business has not come into town. And I, 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 I think the select board members understand this, but I, and I'm not pointing any fingers or suggesting you don't, but I just think for the record, it's worth saying that we, as a planning commission and make sure everybody is aware that we really try to weigh a whole lot of things. Ken mentioned making current existing businesses non-conforming. That's not a good thing to do. At the same time, you know, it doesn't make, it didn't make sense. It's not just an issue of whether somebody knew the regulations ahead of time for the hair salon. It doesn't make sense that um, on one side of Park Row, a hair salon's allowed, and the other side it's not. And in the same district, there's a, a service station and a, you know, an auto parts store. I mean, we, we try to look at, which is and simplify things, but also have them make sense. Not only with what's there, but 
what we want the town to be. And so I would really like to have some input from the select board and that you said, if there's anything you could do is really, what is it that you're really looking for in a little broader picture? Not just let's make sure businesses that want to help grow and sustain our town have a place to go, but what is, what, what is, I don't know that I've heard from the select board, um, you know, as a whole or individuals, kind of what, what would be your definition, let's just take the downtown of what it should be like, because um, that would be really helpful as we try to weigh and find a balance with all of these competing interests. Yeah, and, and and I I'm not I totally hear you, and I, I don't know how you know I just I I recently went through the process of a zoning application, and I think one of my requests would just be a streamline, and and I think that the the rule book is there, but um, I was a little surprised at the process, and I need to do a little bit more reflection before I want to comment on it, but. I'll, I'll try to take the time to think a little bit more about that, but I think the process and Alyssa maybe can speak to it, but um, I would love to review that. Um, but, and, you know, the other thing that I've noticed comes up in some of these meetings is the parking where years ago was you get the approval and then you go to the village trustees and they would, they would go like that with parking. And I heard that they never denied a project parking came up in the meeting that I attended the other night. And, and I, I feel like we do have to address that head on in the conversation surrounding, and, I, and maybe you already have in the new regs, but um, you know, I know I think Montpelier doesn't even have a parking requirement unless it's residential. Um, I just fear that that's coming to a head in these meetings where they're, it, it's really becoming a focus where it wasn't in the past. And I know that we have conversations around parking and whether we have an issue and then we do a study and then you know, I think we got, we've gotten lucky with some uh, private parking lots that have luckily turned even the paid parking lot. I, 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 years ago, I thought that was a bad idea, but now I love it. <laughs> like, I love the idea that somebody kept that parking lot instead of developing it. Um, but yeah, parking is something that I definitely would like to have a conversation about and just what the plan might be there. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll try to do that. And, and, you know, as a board, I, you know, sometimes I think it's hard for us to think some of that through when we're on the, the stage. So maybe it would take more of just, I know we have a couple of select board members that were on the DRB. So they, they understand that process and maybe some of the hiccups they've seen. So that's great. We have two, uh, I don't know if Chris, you were on the, on the DRB before, but you know, we have some knowledge there that maybe we can, we can help you with that. And uh, I hope we can, we can help move it, move it forward. That'd be great. Mark. Yeah, one just very quick thing, and maybe I really appreciate everything that the Planning Commission is doing, but I'm going to ask very point blank to Ken and Steve, can we have a date that we could at least look at interim zoning bylaws, you know, some, yeah, I'm not going to say exact date, but pretty close, <laughs> one month, three months, one year, five years, you know, I, I, I think we got to know, I think we got to you know, work toward a date that we could we could move at least some of this forward. Well, one one thing you should understand, Michael, is that interim zoning isn't required to go through the planning commission by state law. So right. interim zoning is something that you as a select board would enact. Now I know in in the time I've been on the planning commission, there have been a couple of different things where interim zoning was enacted and the planning commission was part of the process, not because we were required to, but it made some sense. Um, right, I think that's what we would wanna do. Right, um, well, you know, as Steve mentioned earlier, the planning commission's next meeting is a week from tonight. So, you know, we'll have to bring this conversation to the planning commission and, you know, see if we can get something done. Having said that, um, we're in the first week of December. Um, we only meet a maximum of maybe 22 times a year, right? Twice a month. You got some holidays in there that get in the way. 
a snowstorm, who knows? Um, so could we get something done by this summertime? Maybe, again, you gotta be able to count to three. Um, Mary and I are only two, so we can only promise so much here tonight. But um, certainly what I can promise you is that on Monday, we'll bring this to the board and say, let's see if we can focus on something and get something done in the downtown area so we can bring it to you this summertime, summer 2021. Okay. Um, thank, thanks for your comments, Ken. And Mary, to partially answer your question, um, and I, as uh, I'll mirror what Mark said, and I'm going to give this some more thought, but um, my simple answer would be, um, if somebody asked me, you know, what, you know, what could be done to, to make the process uh, more simple for the applicant, um, is to streamline the process to the point where the initial conversation between the applicant and the industry professional, who is the zoning administrator, is a transparent, easygoing conversation where the rules are explained in a way where they're understandable to the average client who comes in. Um, you know, the average business owner, the average homeowner. Um, so that the language is, is understandable and so that by the time, if it's needed, by the time that an application does get to the DRB, parties are informed and the rules are, the rules are not in question. The rules are, are, are understandable by all sides. And, um, you know, I know that that's, that's a pretty broad statement, but that's, no, that's, that's kind of at the basis of the conversation problem that I saw was between the applicant and uh, staff of just misunderstandings of what could actually happen. Is it possible to do that though, Nat? Is it possible to define Anything's possible. regs in such a manner that there's no convoluted um, ability to, to, to misinterpret them? Uh, I think that's the case with, with almost anything that's written in legislation. There's always a way of, I won't say splitting the hairs or... That's why we have lawyers. That's why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's face it. I think we all understand that yeah. the zoning regulation process requires lines in the sand. Yeah. If we don't have lines in the sand, we'd have a free for all. And sometimes those lines get in the way. And, you know, does it mean we scribble out a few lines here and redraw them in a different way by not only meaning, but also areas? Um, that's, that's the tough task. If I could comment, uh, yeah. if I could comment just briefly on, on Nate's point question, which is that I mean I agree those are all those are all you know great goals and you know when a, when a potential applicant comes into the town, it should be a straightforward and cordial and business like conversation and you know that's the way it should be. Um, having said that, you know perfection is an illusory goal. Um, you know we live in an imperfect world. The other comment that I would make is sometimes applicants don't hear what they want to hear and they could come in the office and they could have the most cordial, friendly, straightforward black and white conversation on the earth, but it may not uh, result in the answer they want to hear. And so sometimes, and speaking as somebody who's worked on that side of the desk for a while, um, an applicant shows up at the DRB and says, I, I don't understand. They, they didn't explain to me why it was I can't do whatever it is. Now, that doesn't mean that what they want to do is a bad thing necessarily, but sometimes things do get represented in that way. Um, having said that, I do agree with you, you know, and it's been part of our goal is to try to make this as simple as we possibly can, understanding that there are a lot of complexities and hopefully uh, eliminate some of the, the definitional challenges that exist under the current regulations. All right, I 
I really appreciate the time we've taken on this tonight. I want to move the meeting forward. If no one has anything else, I think we'll move on. But I really appreciate all the members of the Planning Commission um, attending tonight. Um, thank you so much. And I think um, uh, we look forward to moving forward. Bill, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I think about 45 minutes or so, both Steve and Ken talked about, you know, uh, uh, a tangible thing that can be done right away is Steve can send out a map we can all agree on what the downtown is and where it is. So we don't have the, this side of Park Row and that side of Park Row kind of thing out there. I think that's the first thing that we should do. And, and then right after that, I think both Mary and, and Ken, as well as staff has heard that, you know, you want to be a little bit more flexible with the regulations than they currently are written. And, I think just some of the definitions will need to be uh, updated uh, because there are things that don't fit. And there's, as Chris just said, there's no way that you're gonna create a use table that covers everything that somebody might wanna do unless you say you can do anything you want in this district. You know, that anytime you start to delineate, there's gonna be somebody on the outside looking in. So uh, the problem, I can't remember the illusory, I think is the term Ken used. And it's true. It's there's not a perfect system out there, and we can make it better, but I don't want anybody to think that it means that we'll never have this conversation again. Great. With that, we can Thank move you. on. Thanks again. Um, we are going to move on to discussion of special appropriations and articles. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for everybody's patience. So Mark, um, special appropriations and special articles. Um, I think all of you uh, select board members received an email last week from uh, Jim Boylan from the Mad River Valley. And uh, he, he raised the issue of um, somehow evaluating uh, the requests for special articles. And I sent an email back to him that I included all of you on that indicated that while I thought his goals were laudable, I, I think that there, I saw a lot of problems in what he was suggesting. But Mike asked for this issue to be on the agenda tonight. He got in contact with Carla and me on Friday. So I'm gonna let Mike talk about it because he's the one that asked to have this conversation. Sure, uh, thanks Bill. Um, this has always been an issue I know I've brought up in the past and I think it's something that's worth some of our attention. I think uh, in uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Boylan, Boylan's um, thing, he said in his first sentence, Let's face it, special appropriations is a mess. And there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, if everyone read that, he included in his research, you know, whether they should put special appropriations, you know, as articles for, for um, Australian ballot. I don't think that's a good secret but a, a, good, a good method that we should probably be using. But I think there needs to be some more scrutiny. If you looked at the application that he had for nonprofits, that's going to be very onerous on a lot of the nonprofits. The bigger nonprofits, the senior center, the child, uh, children's room, et cetera, those groups may be able to do that. Some of the other groups are gonna have a fairly hard time. One thing I think that's really, to me, that's really important is that every group has someone who's desig that's designated to be able to speak at town meeting. And I think, you know, uh, in my opinion, I think these special associations deserve to be heard at town meetings. I think for time's sake, we have developed a good system on grouping the smaller items together. But I do think what, deserves some merit is a little bit of a questionnaire, but being very much streamlined compared to the one 
that Mr. Boylan developed. I think that was just, you know, would be very, you know, you know, as he, he put, I think, in his uh, email, you know, any nonprofit worth the soul would be able to do this in several hours. I think several hours is not really a fair representation for someone looking for $250. I think it's something that should be able to be put together within within an hour. Good basic information. Most of the time, you know, I'm looking for, and this is this is what I would like to review in a special appropriations request. I want to see how it's affected Waterbury citizens. I think that to me is the most important thing. I think as he puts, you know, some of this is more charity. And I don't necessarily think town money is really designed to support charities just in general. I think, you know, there are a lot of things that people could support on their own because there are good organizations, but I think in or, a, any organization that we do have a special appropriation should have benefit to Waterbury citizens. And I don't know, that's just my thought. Again, if I don't know if I have there are any other comments because I thought if we used a you know an application similar to the one he presented, I think that's gonna I'm I don't know if people think that's a good thing by eliminating some of the you know small appropriations. I, I would like to keep those because I think there are a lot of worthy causes that community members would like to see support, but I want them to be used by Waterbury citizens. And I'll let leave it open to what, anyone else to comment. Well, a lot of these appropriations go towards um, organizations that serve the state, a statewide uh, boundary line. And, you know, in the past, we used to have people come to a town meeting and stand up individually and talk about the mission of the organization that they're working for. Um, the only way to somehow try to guarantee that your money's not getting thrown out the window, now that you know that that would work, is to have some form of a list of achievements that from year to year that these organizations, without getting into too much of the weeds, something that you know could be easily fact-checked. I think I told couple of the different board members or different groups of board members at a couple of town meetings that years ago, there was one town that looked into a lot of their special article um, organizations and found out that there was a fair amount of abuse on certain organizations and they pulled the plug. They pulled the plug on those people, those organizations, and they gave the money towards the ones that were really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, that was a news clip that was know on tv that that uh, talked about that and uh, how they went about doing it is beyond me i don't know bill, I, th oh. bill, I think you had mentioned at one point that there's nothing to be said that some of those couldn't be moved on to the especially ones that have been there for years that we have agreed maybe with the historically for the same amount of money over time that they could move to the budget instead of necessarily being a special article because there are some budget items that are basically special articles that we've just moved on to the budget side. I think you've just muted yourself. I think those have tended to be the larger ones versus the smaller ones. Yeah, but it, and, and for the, you know, maybe, maybe this process that this guy Boylan laid out could be used to evaluate whether you're going to move it from a special article to into your budget. I mean, we've got, you know, the senior center gets thirty thousand dollars from Waterbury, and what we've done, and it, it goes back a number of years, where you know they were getting ten thousand dollars a year uh, in a special article. Then we put it in the budget, and then they wanted thirty, and the select board at the time said, "Well, we're going to budget for the ten and we'll put the 20 on as a special article and see if the town wants to give that to you. And we've just kind of left it like that for now. Uh, maybe after a time uh, that they've been uh, receiving an appropriation, maybe the evaluation process that Mike is talking about 
or Mr. Boylan is talking about could be used to move them from special articles to, uh, to budget line items. Um, but I appreciate the problem, but you know, if you, if you set up a system for special articles that's going to take an organization any longer to do than it takes to get the 200 signatures that are necessary. I mean, this guy Boylan is kind of saying, well, fill out this whole application and we're going to review all this and do all these things. But if the organization submits a petition to the select board with the right amount of signatures, it goes on the warning. The select board can still maybe try to get the information and maybe they can recommend at the meeting to turn something down. But I, I think that would be a, a difficult challenge. Um, but um, I do think the thing that Boylan said to me that was most interesting was that um, Vermont is almost unique in that it allows municipalities to use tax dollars to appropriate to uh, social service agencies without having some quid pro quo that there's not a contract that you're going to do X, Y, and Z for us. In other places, they don't let this happen. Um, I just sent them an email at the beginning of the meeting saying, you know, I agree with the issue of special articles and I've commented to all of you that we go through this big process where, you know, you've told me now uh, we, we want a 51 cent tax rate again in 2021. We might have to make cuts to our programs, but none of these special articles get any cuts, you know? So um, I, I told them, if you really want to make inroads on this, you got to get the legislature to change the law that says it's not legal to do this. But, uh, you know, we'll see how quickly they take that up. So anyway. Bill, what risk is there um, pro or con against, you know, for putting these things, some of these things perhaps right in the budget? I mean, looking, looking further down the road. Well, the, so to those who would say that, well, you're, you're putting it in the budget and therefore you're not letting people vote on it, that's not true. The budget gets voted on by the voters and at open town meeting, if the people spoke up just like they did a few years ago and asked us to have a full-time rec director, they could say, hey, we don't really wanna pay this money that's in the budget for that particular uh, agency. So it, putting it in the budget doesn't take it out of the people's hands. It's not a direct vote on that particular appropriation, but people can still ask about it. So I don't think it really hurts that way. Um, the major pro of putting it in the budget as opposed to the special articles is that, you know, compared to the budget discussion, the special articles take about three times as long to get through at town meeting. To, to me, you, I, I could see a lot of things that could show up in the budget is things like Green Mountain Transit, you know, things that really benefit the community that you're going to see some, you know, some benefit. The things that are a little bit more nebulous, I may want a little bit of a discussion, you know. It's always good when you see their town report and that they include how many Waterbury residents. I think that should be always require that they include how many Waterbury residents that they did serve. And to me, that would be a test after a while, if they're not serving Waterbury residents, maybe we don't want to, you know, maybe the select board has some ability to say, you know, you know, the select board doesn't want to entertain this particular charity because it's not benefiting Waterbury residents. My opinion. Yes, that was going to be my question. If it was put in there as a budgetary item, does the select board have the chance? Does the select board have the opportunity or the ability to adjust that number, whatever it may be, one way or the other, during during you know good We're time? We're doing that in budget con conversations. You know, when we that's what I'm go, saying. Go through the budget when we do it in January, February, etc. You know, to determine what our budgets. You know, that we're giving Bill guidance, and if we saw that Green Mountain Transit was asking for $75,000 and we didn't think that was 
a reasonable amount, yeah, I think we could cut that back. I agree with that thought. So I think there are some things that are definitive that you can, I think, put as budget items. I think there are a lot of other things we, we would still, but again, I, you know, I'm a, a big strong proponent because a, that you want to have require someone has a representative to speak to the, to their organization. You know, I always hate that, you know, the same two, three individuals, they know a little bit about the, the organization. They say, oh, it's good mom and apple pie, but they really don't know enough about the organization. And no one's brave enough to, to say no. That's the only benefit to Australian ballot things is a lot more people would click, click that button or get the pencil to say no on a particular item. And I'm not wanting to take money away from these organizations, but, you know, and that's why I think they do deserve discussion at town meeting versus being done on Australian ballot. Bill, did you want to talk about anything else on this tonight or should we move on? Okay. I'm all set. Okay. Uh, discuss options for town meeting. Okay. Um, we, we, we're in December. I'm in the process of uh, starting the, the whole budget building process. We'll really get into that in January at your December 21st meeting. I hope to have a couple of budgets anyway that we can review. Um, we'll have to make a decision uh, no later than we um, uh, have to publish the warning about how we're gonna conduct town meeting. And I think Carla may have sent out a link to you folks uh, to look at some of the things the legislature is um, considering and has already decided upon. I guess the big thing from uh, Carla's perspective and, and mine to a little bit lesser degree is how are we going to conduct town meeting this year? Uh, we are an open town meeting town that has been our tradition and I think most of us appreciate it and like it. Uh, the legislature has already uh, passed uh, rules that are applicable to 2021 town meeting only that will allow any town by vote of the select board to conduct its town meeting by Australian ballot completely uh, without the requisite having a town meeting to get the town's people to vote to go Australian ballot, which is the normal procedure. So, um, you know, here we are in December, we're pretty much under pretty strict orders from the governor about, um, you know, keeping crowds down, staying at home when possible, uh, not visiting family, not having groups more than 10 people, what have you. Um, and March is not all that far away. And it seems unlikely, given what I think we're all seeing on the news that anything dramatic is going to uh, change that before town meeting gets here. Um, so if we decide to have our town meeting conducted by Australian ballot, that will have to be decided in January. It's only a month away when the warning has to be done. It's, uh, it's probably what the third week in January, the fourth week in January, um, Carla, that the warning has to be Ready to go? Uh, pretty much the last day in January, the 29th. Okay. So uh, we have all of January to think about this. What you need to know, though, is that while the legislature has already allowed towns like ours to have their select board choose to have an Australian ballot meeting, they did not waive the requirement that says if you're having an Australian ballot town meeting, uh, you're required to have a public information meeting no later than 10 days prior to the meeting. So if town meeting is on March 2nd or 
uh, yeah, March 2nd this year, um, you know, we would have to have a uh, public information meeting uh, no later than 10 days before that. So the last week of January probably would, I mean, the last week of February would be when you had to do that. Um, and if we're going to have an Australian ballot town meeting in order to not require everybody to get together, we're going to have to have the special public information meeting by Zoom. Um, and, and, you know, I've already got staff looking into our Zoom license. Right now, uh, we're limited to the number of people that we can have on one of these Zoom meetings. I can't remember if it's 50 or 100 right now, but it's certainly not enough to take care of everybody that might want to come to town meeting or special public information meeting. So we're looking into what we have to do to up our Zoom meeting um, uh, capability. But I did want to ask the board, um, given the fact that we're going to have to have a public information meeting, um, we have three choices, really. We can either just say, forget it, we're going to have open town meeting and just do it like we always have, and we'll all see you at the school in March. I think that would be unwise, and we might be shut down by the governor's office saying, hey, you can't do that. Um, if we have to have a public information meeting by Zoom, some are saying, well, why don't we just have town meeting by Zoom? Let it be an open town meeting and do it by Zoom. Um, that, to me, seems rather unwieldy, um, trying to figure out who's trying to make motions, who's wanting to ask questions, uh, you know, all of the parliamentary procedure that goes along with a with a, with an open town meeting would would apply if we had open town meeting by Zoom. So I think, from my perspective, thinking about it, the easiest thing to do would be to have all of our public questions by Australian ballot, and then sometime the last week of February, have a Zoom meeting and do basically what the school board does with the Harwood budget, which is, you know, we're gonna meet at seven o'clock on Tuesday, whatever the date, and we're gonna present information about the budget, we're gonna present information about other articles, let people ask questions, but you don't have to worry about all the parliamentary procedure that goes along with having an open town meeting. So I just wanted to, Kind of toss that out there right now and see how you board members felt about this. Um, I think we can accommodate anything that you decide that you want, but I don't want to have to accommodate it by finding out about it for 11th hour. So we're talking about it now. Yeah, given the restrictions that we're under right now, Bill, I, I mean, I, I think what you've proposed sounds like a, um, well, it sounds like a good way to proceed. Um, I don't see that we can hold any kind of in-person assembly. Uh, it's just, it's just not going to work. I would also add that it's very complicated to have the, um, in-person voting on the day of town meeting. We have to take great precautions to keep people safe. So I couldn't see us in the gym doing that with other people in the gym as well. We need like a whole gym to space people out. Right, because if we do go to Australian balloting, um, <clears throat> Carla, you know, um, there's discussions happening in the legislature now uh, and will be more when they're when they're uh, going to session in January. But you know, there's talk again about you know um, mailing ballots. Some towns have chosen that they're going to mail a ballot to everyone on the checklist. Uh, I think that's not our uh, recommendation. I think we would recommend that we conduct the Australian ballot meeting at town meeting the same way we do 
any Australian ballot meeting, which is we'll have a, the polling place will be open on town meeting day and people who want absentee ballots uh, can request them and have them mailed to them in advance. I think that's Carla's preference. Um, how many on the checklist, Carla? Over 4,000. Yeah, so when the when we just went through the general election, the state took all of the um, all of the responsibility for mailing those ballots and for providing the postage for both the mailing and the return envelope, right? That's correct. And uh, you know, with four thousand ballots, you know, if you had to mail them all out and then re you know require uh, return postage, you're, you know, you're over $4,000 pretty, pretty easily. Um, and, uh, I think that allowing people to request the ballots and having them, uh, mailed in advance is, is fine. And I expect that participation will be high again since COVID has struck participation. I think in you know, all of your elections have been really high comparatively, haven't they, Carla? I, I would say so. Yes. Yeah, so. Carla, um, Carla, how many people do we have voting at a normal town meeting election? Between seven and 800. Okay, that's about what I thought. That's, yeah. that's, the, that's the number of ballots that that get. Um, right. Uh, right. Maybe less than 100 absentee and maybe 600 the day of. Right, and we have, you know, at, at the high point of of our open town meeting, you know, we might have a couple hundred people in the in the room, um, but the 600 or so that Carl is talking about is the number of ballots that are actually cast for, you know, select board positions and school board positions and those things. Right, and I can't. It's impossible to run a safe election in a third of the gym. Right. So the, the Zoom meeting, um, public information meeting, to me sounds like the best way to do it, rather than trying to have a, you know, open town meeting by Zoom and, you know, having people making motions and amending motions and everything else. I think that would be rather chaotic. And uh, Bill, according to that um, Vermont League of Cities, that, that they said they we can't hold the town meeting, including uh, floor voting remotely. They said no. So that's not even an option. They said no to that? Yep. I'm looking okay. at it right in front of me. All right. Well, the legislature is going to go in, and I just saw a news thing tonight. They may change that in January, but... If it's no now, everything's what, fluid. I know that's what we would live with. But even if they do allow it, so if they if they do address that issue and allow it, staff's recommendation is that we have Australian balloting for this year um, and have the open public yeah. information meeting by Zoom. Because this is the answer. It says no. There is currently no explicit authority in Vermont law for municipalities con to conduct town meeting that are held from the floor by electronic means. Vermont League of Cities and Towns advocacy team strongly encourages municipal officers to reach out to their legislatures, legislators and request temporary voluntary authority to hold their 2021 town meeting remotely. Please contact our advocacy team if you have further questions. So it could potentially happen because right. I could see where some towns will have zoom meeting and it's going to be authorized yeah i and that's what i'm getting at i think i think that there is a movement by some towns to allow that i thought it was i didn't realize it was not allowable already but right. really i believe there are going to be towns that ask for that um, i think that's a cumbersome process when you're our town and especially by zoom you end up you could have a lot of people trying to participate. So I think the for one year, uh, the Australian balloting is a better option with the public information meeting. Um, the legislature has already made it clear that this is a one year only deal. And then you go back to how it was before. Um, 
it's it's the board's call. So you don't have to make a decision tonight, but uh, we've got to make it relatively soon. So, Bill, I guess one thing I'd like to say is that the board has kind of pointed you in a direction as far as our tax rate. Um, if that happens to stay to that close number, I don't perceive a lot of things really changing. Um, so to have huge debates over our budget when it's basically a du I won't say a duplicate of last year, but probably a close facsimile. Can't imagine there'd be any reason to to have anything other than what you're suggesting. Well, that works for me. <laughs> Bill, how do how do we amend? Like, for instance, we always have a discussion of the budget and we may kind of you know, in discussions, this or that kind of happens and something may cause an amendment to, you know, the budget. I assume that can happen if we're going to, we're going to basically say, here's a dollar amount, the information, the informational meeting is going to present information as to what we're, why we did what, and then they're either going to have to say, you know, $5 million, yay and nay. Right. Yep. Yeah, there's there's no amending it in us in an Australian right, dollar. Right, exactly. You're exactly right, and that's why, you know, in general, I don't like the Australian balloting option. I think it is helpful uh, for us to be able to have the discussions that we have. Um, but this year, I think, like so many other things, it's just a different year, and this will be. I think it will be the most efficient way to do it. And I agree with what Chris just said. So that, that's how I think we should do it for 21. Okay, so we won't make a motion tonight, but it sounds like we're all in agreement on direction, so. All right. Um, we'll go to manager's items. HMMC property tax appeal to Vermont Superior Court. Okay, good. Um, so I sent out on Saturday, I, uh, a whole series of PDFs uh, and gave you some information about this. This is the second year in a row that the Hunger Mountain Child Care Center um, appealed their, uh, the fact that they're a taxable uh, property taxpayer to the Board of Listers and um, I don't remember if last year they appealed to the BCA as well. I think they did. Um, anyway, this year they did the same thing. They, they have taken issue and believe that they should be a tax exempt organization, ask the listers to exempt them from taxation based on uh, the, the state law. The listers found that they did not meet the criterion and denied the request. It went to the BCA and the Board of Civil Authority um, in a decision on October 28th uh, upheld the Lister's decision and indicated that um, uh, they did need to pay property taxes. Um, last week, we received in the mail um, an appeal of that decision from a law firm in Rutland, Pratt, Breland, Neely, Martin, and White, uh, who are the attorneys for the Hunger Mountain Child Care, and they have appealed that BCA decision to Superior Court. So tonight, my request to you is to simply ask you to uh, authorize uh, Stitzel, Page, and Flesher to enter, enter an appearance on behalf in court, and I sent you uh, Sometime today, I sent to you a motion that I hope one of you will make, and I would recommend the board pass that motion. Um, I, I think we probably shouldn't go into a whole lot of detail about the case right now until we have uh, legal representation. Um, I don't, we shouldn't say anything one way or the other how we feel about things. We just need to respond to the fact that we have been. Um, that our decision has been appealed. So for tonight, I would ask you to, to 
to accept my recommendation to engage Stitzel Page and Fletcher and uh, Joe McLean will probably be the lead attorney on it. And then at that point, once he files the requisite paperwork with the uh, court, uh, then he through, uh, through me will advise the board as to where we're going. And then at some point we may end up having to have a meeting with them. Bill, well, or Mark, I guess what I move to authorize Stitchell Page and Fletcher to enter an appearance on behalf of the town in the appeal of Hunger Mountain Children's Center from a decision of the Board of Civil Authority and take such other steps as it deems appropriate in consultation with the town manager to represent the town's interest and or defend the appeal. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you. Uh, next up, zoning enforcement legal action. Okay, similarly on this one, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit more information here, but um, there's been a, a property on Moody Court. Uh, Darren Tebow owns the property at Five Moody Court, which is over off of Park Row, uh, Park Street, uh, you know, little private road that goes in off of the, uh, just beyond the train station. And he's got some uh, structures there that don't need setbacks. And more importantly, there's uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, junk that has built up in his, his yard. Uh, the measurement, I guess, is that it can be seen from a public highway. It can be seen from Park Street, Park Row, uh, Rotarian Way, and, and Rudy Court itself. Um, and uh, this has been an issue that the zoning administrator has been working on for quite some time. I think we have exhausted all of our efforts. The first, the actual notice of violation that Dina sent to Mr. Tebow was sent over a year ago in October of 2019. She has followed up. Uh, we've had numerous complaints from, from neighbors about this particular property. So um, uh, beginning of November, I um, contacted uh, Dave Rue at Stitzel Page and Fletcher who helps us with a lot of zoning issues. And um, he, on behalf of the town, wrote what he referred to as a last chance letter to the uh, owner of the property in question and said, look, this notice has been issued to you. You're in violation of the bylaw. Please clean it up. Take steps to you know, get your um, issue, get it permitted if it's possible by uh, December 4th. And if you don't, the select board will uh, potentially take action in court. So December 4th was Friday. Um, I checked with Dina, nothing has happened. So my recommendation to you is to allow the zoning enforcement action to go forward, which means uh, filing, um, filing the enforcement action in the uh, environmental division of the Superior Court. So that's my recommendation. I did send you a a motion that I'd like you to, to make and pass uh, earlier today. Would anyone like to make that motion? Yeah. Um, I move to authorize Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher PC to commence a zoning enforcement action uh, in the environmental division of Vermont Superior Court against Darren Tebow at Five Moody Court based upon his failure to remedy the zoning violations addressed in the zoning administrator's October 9, 2019 notice of violation. Second. Any further discussion? All those I in would, favor? Mark, okay. I would like to ask yep. just one general question. Um, yep. Go ahead, Chris. Bill, I don't recall what the line item for um, legal issues was in our budget. I think it might have been around 70,000 between this and the other. Do you have any concept of pure speculation, any concept on whether or not 
we could exceed that line item? Um, no. It, so the 70,000 used to be when we were dealing with the North Hill uh, radio or cell tower. Um, in our general government budget right now, we had a budget of 5,600 this year. And in the zoning bylaw, in the zoning budget, we had a budget of um, 5,500. Um, I think the general, um, the general legal line, I don't have it right in front of me, but I believe we've exceeded that. We've had some things that we had to deal with with regard to COVID. We had that whole issue with the school board election in the spring that we end up having to pay for, even though it's the school board's election. Um, most of this isn't going to happen until 2021 anyway, Chris. So I'll be able to talk with the lawyer and, and try to narrow down. But this should not cost anywhere near as much as what it costs to uh, try to prevent Verizon from putting that cell tower up. So uh, I don't think it's going to make a huge uh, <coughs> in our budget for next year. Okay, that's all I had. All right, anyone else? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, next item. Uh, consider responses to a request for proposal for financing for capital expenditures. Right. So I um, I sent you um, in that email on Saturday, I think it was, yeah, um, the, uh, the four different offers that we had. So I sent out an RFP um, seeking to borrow the 1 million, what was it? $1,366,880. I sent the proposal to four, four banks, the People's United Bank, the Union Bank, the Community National Bank, and uh, Northfield Savings Bank. Um, I was surprised that the People's United Bank, which is the bank that we currently, uh, where we currently have all of our deposits, uh, they were actually the, had the, the least competitive bid. Uh, and whether it's a matter of that they're just getting a little bit, um, you know, taking us for granted, or whether the other banks are really hungry, I was surprised that their proposal was the highest uh, interest rate. Um, my recommendation is that we uh, take the loan from the Community National Bank. 1.55% uh, or 1.5%, whatever it was, I can't, I got it right here. Um, Community Nationals offer was, yeah, 1.55%. Um, you can't really get money much cheaper than that. Um, so that's my recommendation is for you to authorize me to uh, accept Community National Bank's offer. And then uh, it will require us to have a little legal work done. Uh, you did, if you read the proposal, you know, they will have to get a, an opinion from our lawyer that we'll have to pay for. But it shouldn't be, it'll be in the hundreds of dollars, maybe a thousand, but it's not going to be a huge expense. Um, and we'll, you know, get the money, money borrowed here. I expect if everything goes right, uh, I'll work with the bank and the lawyer and at your next meeting on the 21st, have the loan documents, which uh, you'll be able to uh, authorize to be signed and then we'll have the money in the bank before the end of the year. So unless you have any questions, um, I would ask you to make that motion. The only one question I'd have, and you kind of brought it up when you said people's have all, have all our other stuff. Is there, a, you know, is there a possibility of lumping it all into one and get it all refined through a different bank? Yeah, we don't have we don't have very many loans outstanding, Chris. Uh, they, you know, we have our money deposited there, our checking account, uh, where you know how we pay our expenses and everything else. 
uh, we, I think that to, to, we could pay off loans and ask other banks to, you know, refinance the loans, but most of the loans that we have with peoples are, if we have any, I don't even know if we have any with peoples right now. Um, Wait, perhaps I misunderstood you. No, I, what I meant was um, we do our banking with People's United Bank. So we have, you know, at times a couple million dollars in their bank that we're using to pay our bills and pay our, uh, our expenses. And usually in the past, when we've, when we've uh, put these RFPs out, they're always the lowest when it comes to a proposal for, for an interest rate on the loan. And when I talk to the other banks that have you know, given us a little bit higher rate, they would tell me, well, if we had your deposits, we could give you a lower rate. Well, now, you know, Peoples has our deposits. So it, it's a lot of work, but it, the, yeah. the thing that I would consider in the future is, hey, Peoples, do you really do you wanna keep our checking account? Do you wanna keep our billions of dollars in there at all? You know, maybe we should move that to community bank. But anyway, um, we do. The town does not have any direct loans with People's United right now. Chris, I had this discussion with Bill earlier today, and what you're seeing is in the banking environment, a lot of the large regional banks, which basically People's United would be one, or they're moving to an environment that they're less likely to like banking with small entities, even such as small rural towns. And I think the community national banks, the Northfields, you know, they're, that's what their business they want to cultivate. And again, they might be able to give us better rates with our checking and savings. So, you know, because that's sometimes where a big bank will try to give us some loan, if with some loan volume in order for us to give us their checking and savings accounts, you know, that this may be in a reason to move some of our accounts. So, you know, I asked that bill and, you know, Bill said the biggest thing is it was, you know, community national bank at the most advantageous rate. And right. they're, a, they're a good local bank. I, I would highly recommend them. So for right now, the recommendation is, you know, authorize me to, to, uh, take this loan from the community national bank. And then, uh, you know, we can look at whether we want to change our bank at a different time. That can be a different right. issue. But for tonight, I would just like the board to uh, uh, acknowledge the receipt of these four proposals and accept the manager's recommendation to uh, take the loan from community national bank. That's all you have to do tonight. The motion is really very simple. And then at the next meeting, we'll have all the loan documents and everything else ready to go. And uh, can I get a motion? I, I move that we accept the manager's recommendation uh, from the proposals that were received to accept the proposal from Community National Bank. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And you, you did notice if you read the proposals, I did ask that um, the um, that there would be no prepayment penalty. So when we get into 2021, if we decide we want to refund some of this note, you know that it's a it's over a million dollars, and the the bulk of it is for for fire trucks that have a long useful life. We may want to. Uh, you know, refund the note and turn some of that into a bond and there's no prepayment penalty. So we, we're, we're free to do what's best for us uh, in, in this proposal. So thank you very much. All right, next on the list, consider renewing memorandum of understanding for Barb Fire Physician Special Liaison for Community Transportation Projects and Special Assistance for Grants Management and Emergency Planning. Yep. Um, did I send you two MOUs? Yes, I saw. Yeah, I saw one. There were two. 
Yeah, I, I intended to send two. Anyway, um, we've had a we've had an MOU with Fire with Fire um, since she left Armada, which was the company that the town hired to do the uh, flood recovery projects. And I think it was 2014 that she left Armada and came to work for the town. And she finished up the, um, the uh, management of all the long-term recovery projects, including, including the construction of this building. And then as we were transitioning from uh, needing to do those recovery projects to um, the all the transportation projects that we had a hand in or were impacted by, you know, from the interstate bridge project to the Route 2 and Route 100 repaving projects, and then ultimately the big three-year uh, Main Street reconstruction project. FARB has been uh, our liaison in, in, in all of this. Uh, due to COVID, um, it just kind of slipped by me that, um, you know, the, the MOU has typically been in place from April 1st in one year to March 31st the next, and then it gets renewed. Uh, there is an automatic renewal provision in there. So the fact that we didn't renew on April 1st, 2020, um, really didn't matter too much. It wasn't problematic because of the automatic renewal provision that was built into it. And as I indicated, there was no increase in pay for Barb. Uh, she's continuing to work at the same pay rate that she was uh, receiving starting on April 1st, 2019. So I would like the board to um, approve the 2020 um, MOU employment agreement between Barb Farr and the town uh, and approve it retroactively to April 1st, 2020. And since we're having to do this in December, I rather than have it run through uh, March 31st like it did before, this proposal would run from April 1st, 2020 through the end of December. And then the uh, the second proposal that I hope I sent out, uh, I would recommend that that start on January 1st and go through December 31st next year. So um, that's what I would hope that we could do on the uh, 2021. Maybe you should take care of that. The 2021 there, if I'm, if I read it correctly, there's a 2% increase and then her hours got cut back a slight bit, right? About four yeah, hours so or so. The, the one for 2020, uh, her hours, her hourly rate is the same as it was in uh, starting on April 1st, 2019. Uh, for the 2021 um, MOU that starts on, uh, that I propose to start on, on um, January 1st. I'm having a trouble getting back onto my screen here where I can't see everybody. There we go. Well, if, the, if the retroactive one ends the end of December, wouldn't our new one start January 1st? Yes, January 1st. 2021. And you're, you're correct. On that January 1st one, there's a, there is a 2% pay increase in the hourly rate, but her hours are going to drop back from 24 and a quarter to 20. So we'll actually be paying her less in 2020 than we did in 20, in 2021 than we did in 2020. So if you- oh, So it's not, a, it's not an, it's not an over, it's not an overall uh, contract 2% increase. It's based on her hours. Yeah, the at, 2 at her hourly rate. The 2% increase will apply to her hourly yep. rate, but because the yep. hours are gonna be cut back She'll actually be making less. It'll cost the town less in 2021 than it did in 2020. Yeah. So and if, if that I position, go ahead. I'm sorry. If that position gets eliminated, then that'll be a savings of what, 75 or 
whatever seventy six thousand. Well, it's not quite. It's not quite that because um, yeah. if you remember, uh, part of what she does for us, what she does for us for the Main Street project gets reimbursed by uh, VTrans. So I think the net to us is about forty two or forty five or something like that, Chris. It's seventy five, and then I think the VTrans is a little over thirty. Which the reimbursement will be for 2021. Um, but Barb has been very, very helpful in, in many areas. But I, as I said, I believe this will be the last MOU, the last contract that we'll have. And when we get to 2022, um, I, I, I don't see a reason for this particular contract to extend past that. And I know Barb doesn't really want to work past 2021. So it, she's been you know, wanting to get done for a while, but you know she's committed to see the Main Street project through. And and I highly recommend that you approve both of those MOUs that I uh, offered. Well, she's certainly done a fabulous job since the time she's been on board here. So I I got no beef with. Uh, uh, approving this MOU. So I moved to uh, approve the two MOUs, the one from 2019 retroactive to the end of December 2020, and then the new, we do one at a time, Bill? You can, yeah, do do the, uh, just make a motion one. to approve the 2020 retroactive to April 1st, and then vote on that, and then do the same thing for the 2020. So we, have, we have a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, second MOU. I move to uh, approve the new MOU between Barb Farr and the uh, uh, special liaison um, to the town and the community for the year 2021 starting in January 1st to the end of December. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? One quick thing before we vote. Yep. Um, Bill, is Barb wanting to kind of continue through the end of next year? I yeah. Okay. Just want to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Main Street... The actual construction project should finish up around, um, we're hoping June 30th. We hope it doesn't have to go out any longer than that. There's already some talk by McDonald because you know they got squeezed at the beginning of this year that depending on how weather goes, they may have to seek some extension, but I don't think it will be a very long extension. Right. And then after the project is done, there's some, there's some closeout work that has to be done and then, uh, you know, goes through the end of December. I don't believe it will go beyond that, Mike, but that gives us- Okay. Through I, thought, I thought she wanted to retire kind of earlier. That's that's was my question. Well, if, if we finish up and everything gets done, she might not be working through the end of December, but I want to cover the bases in case there's some, you know, snafu with- Right, some need. That we have or available to us if we need to. Totally understand. All right. Uh, motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Um, last one, on managers items, discuss opportunity for town input on operations of the ICE Center. Yeah, thanks. So um, John Siegel, Mike Thompson, and I think Bob Perrett are on the call. There's Jonathan's face coming in and Mike. I don't know if Bob is able to, to share his uh, image with us or not, but they're here. Um, the three of them are on the board of directors of the Ice Center of Washington West. Um, I think most of you know these gentlemen. Um, they've been involved with the Ice Center uh, really going back, uh, at least Jonathan, before its inception, and Bob and Mike uh, probably uh, almost as far back anyway. Um, so 
the ICE Center is a private not-for-profit organization that provides uh, uh, recreation opportunities through ice skating to the greater Waterbury slash Harwood community. Uh, you know, the Harwood hockey team plays there. Uh, there's a youth hockey league that's there. There's numerous, um, you know, private men's and women's and co-ed leagues that play there. Uh, there's public skating. It's, it's a facility that gets a lot of use. And, and I think over time, uh, most of us have seen its worth to the community, uh, not only for the recreation opportunity that it affords us, but also, um, you know, opportunities for, for business. Uh, people come from all over the region to, to play games there. Certainly, um, you know, scholastic uh, varsity hockey for Harwood. Uh, they play games here for both um, the boys and the girls teams. So, um, and then the youth leagues, uh, you know, there are people, there are kids that come here and play from, from all over the state and probably greater New England and maybe even into to Canada. So there's opportunities for restaurants and, and lodging facilities and gas stations and, and uh, what have you to, uh, to do business with the people that come into the community. The ICE Center is closed currently. Um, and it, it, uh, it was open through March 13th when the governor closed kind of everything down. Uh, fortunately, the hockey season, the, the school hockey season was just ended at that point in time. And I'll let uh, John and Mike and Bob talk to you about how operations were affected. But in, this, in the spring through the summer, while the uh, facility was closed, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have ice in the facility. So they, they did what they could to keep their expenses down. Um, just so you know, as board members, uh, the ICE Center has a loan through the uh, Edward Fry Utility District's UDAG fund. <clears throat> this goes back uh, to, the, to the beginning of, of time with them. They've refinanced, they've, they've taken additional loans over time. And uh, the utility district uh, to help businesses, not just the ICE Center, all the uh, eight businesses that have loans through the UDAG fund, um, the commissioners agreed to suspend interest in principal payments and actually cut interest to zero. So <clears throat> not only uh, are the borrowers not having to pay anything right now, their loans are not increasing because every month there's an interest payment that comes due. Interest has been suspended for the time being. Um, that certainly helped, I think, all of these businesses, the ICE Center in particular. Um, I think they put ICE back into the facility and reopened. And, and now because of the most recent uh, executive order from the governor's office has have had to close again. Um, and, you know, they've been in conversation with me. I had a meeting with uh, Mark Fryer and Skip Flanders. Skip is the, the, the uh, chairperson of the EFI board of directors. We had a Zoom meeting last week just to talk about how things were going there. And one of the things that the ICE Center uh, folks talked about was, you know, maybe we should find a way to have better communications, more transparent communications with the community, uh, not looking for anything specific, but maybe there's an opportunity to have a representative of uh, the town and possibly EFUD serve on their board of directors. So with that long introduction, I'll turn it over to, to the guys from the ICE Center um, and make plain that there's no request here for anything to happen. They're not you know, saying, we're going under, you got to take this over. That's, that's not on the table right now. Uh, and I don't think is, is going to be on the table at all. But um, I'll stop talking and let 
John or the other two guys uh, chime in here, and then you can all ask questions if you want. So I, I guess I'll start. Um, hi, uh, Bill's right. We shut down in March. We took out our ice and kind of just everything closed down over the summer. We put our ice back in the beginning of September, started up with all the protocols and COVID things you had to do. And then I guess it was a few weeks ago, we shut down again when the governor said that he was suspending uh, school sports and whatever, but we still have our ice in. So now we're kind of in limbo. We have the ice in, we're trying to cut our expenses, but our primary expense is electricity for refrigeration. Um, and we're just kind of waiting to see what happens, whether there's gonna be a hockey season or not. And other than that, um, I don't know what else to tell you. Um, maybe Bob or Mike has something they wanna to add to that. We're basically just kind of treading water at the moment, treading ice, I guess it would be. You guys have anything to add or? I mean, I just say operationally, when we did open, it was a nice surprise that almost everybody came back as best we could. We had a, we had a red less ice for cleaning protocols, but you know, the youth groups came back, the adults group groups came back when they had to wear masks, they wore masks. So we didn't really see deterioration from a demand standpoint. We saw some usage slippage and some higher costs because of the COVID protocols, but it was certainly nice to see that um, the interest was still out there from the youth all the way up to the adult groups. And, um, you know, if we got a clearer answer, you will have to make a decision, but, you know, if we knew we were going to be closed for two or three months, we'd take the ice out. If it's going to be six weeks, we could leave the ice in. So we're just rolling the dice right now, waiting for more information to see if we should take the ice out or not. So there is obviously then, given what you just said there, Bob, there's a cost to taking the ice out, and I'm sure there's a cost to putting the ice in, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just the electric and gas propane use on a weekly basis is, you know, north of 2500 approaching $3,000 a week. So, but it, it'll cost us 20 grand to put the ice back in. By the time you have to lay, take it out, put it in, lay it, lay it back down, hire somebody to come in and do it, you know, all the refrigeration that has to take place to, to you know, get the ice back to, back to temp. Um, so, you know, call your break even eight weeks, something like that. But every week we go by, if we're going to have to close it, we're just thinking money right now, but we'd rather not close it if we think there's a chance we could open in late, late uh, January, early, early February. So except, except for the fact that you got, um, uh, able to read the barometer and had everybody come back. In a sense, it's almost too bad that that the governor, you know, that things looked up and, and you were able to put the ice back in. It would have, you'd be in a better position probably if you had just kept the ice out and we just kind of limped along to the end of whatever this is, right? Yeah, or I've done what other rinks did, and some rinks opened in late June. We decided to wait it out, and then it actually caught, it hurt us more than waiting in that sense hurt us. We probably would have been a little bit okay. I mean, demand seemed to be there in the summer, would have been there in the summer, but we chose to take the safe way out and uh, wait, and then you know it didn't really didn't really pay off. We were worried yeah. about a spike in the virus rate around here and it didn't really happen and then we opened up and then it happened not at our rink but it happened in the state and it happened at another rink right. and you've you've been in operation for what 17 18 years something like that my 17th birthday is december 15th okay and and without before covid i mean nobody's getting rich down there at the ice center right but you're 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 making ends meet, right? You're, you're paying is, our bills. Is your bill, yes. concern, you're able to to offer this this um, facility, and you've been able to pay your bills, right? Correct. Yes. You have a high 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 point and a low point of revenue stream during the course of the year. Do you have that information off the top of your head when you're yeah. bringing in the most money? And yeah, so basically from. November through March are our, our uh, peak months, and that's where we, you know, where we're 
we're, we're uh, generating positive cash flow. And then some, the other months where, you know, summertime, some of that area, those months were have negative cash flow. So this is hard because this is our peak season. Yeah. That was one of the reasons we delayed opening the ice, uh, putting the ice back in in the summer, because we thought, you know, even though there was demand, it's not our typically strong season. So we thought to open up in our weak season didn't make sense. We thought September would have been perfect and had this uh, infection rate not skyrocketed in the state the way it did, you know, a month ago, we'd probably be doing okay, but. Right. And, and we did get PPP money and we got some Vermont grant money. So that carried us most of the way through the summer. Right. And as I said, you know, the, the commissioners at EFOD have been, I think, very generous. Uh, they've given consideration to most everything that I've recommended to them to consider. And, uh, you know, they're committed to the fact that, you know, we, we want to see this organization succeed. And I think it's safe to say that EFOD is trying to be as creative as they can be and will continue to be so. So, you know, that that loan itself, you know, you've, you've never missed a payment. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that once you get back on your feet again and you're able to start running as normal, um, you know, you'll be able to do that again. And I, I just want the select board to know that uh, the, the commissioners with EFUD, this is UDAG money, it's not taxpayer money. Um, you know, they've been pretty, um, pretty conscientious about how they loan the money, what terms it's lent to the various businesses on, and, uh, you know, but they are able to be flexible. And I think that what will probably happen is that EFOD will continue to be willing to, you know, defer things and let the, the uh, ICE Center kind of catch up with everything else. And then when the time is right, we can turn the switch back on again. So um, I, I want the select board to understand that I think EFOD is doing what it can within reason to, to help out. But John and uh, Bob and Mike, you had talked to me when we met uh, a month or so ago, that you know maybe there's this opportunity to you know have some representative on your board from the town of Nifa. Do you want to talk about what what your thoughts are there at all? To see, you know, I don't think they have to make a decision tonight, but but what what's your idea behind that? Well, I, it was mostly just to increase communication and. It, it, we've kind of been like operating in a vacuum in our own little corner of the building <laughs> there and things have been going on pretty well but uh it'd be nice if like we owe the village udag quite a bit of money and it was the thought was maybe they should have a representative on our board um we've got a very lean board there's five board members uh, Mary Brown and Charlie Barber are also board members. They're not in on this meeting tonight. Um, our rink manager um, quit in the middle of the summer. We hired Timmy Griffith, who's a local guy. Um, he's done an amazing job um, keeping this thing going and running it. I've been very impressed with his managerial skills. Um, so things are going okay. Um, like Bill said initially, we're not looking for anything. We're not coming here to ask for anything. We're not coming to, you know, change any policy except that offer that if the town and if EFUD wanted to be more connected and involved, we're open to it. And that way everybody knows what's going on. We'd like to think we're a good member of the community and that we're as bill said we attract a lot of people to the the businesses in the village and whatever and um we hope we've proved our worth 17 years is pretty good track record i think we're proud of it but jonathan has there been any consideration for possible fundraising to try to help ease the pain at all or 
Well, we don't really need to do that at the moment, and we've never fundraised for operations. Any fundraising we've ever done has been for capital projects. And um, most have, you know, there are about 25 indoor rinks in the state, and all but three of them are owned by municipalities or schools. It's us, Montpelier, and Manchester, uh, Vermont. And if you see what goes on in some of these other communities, Stowe is a perfect example. They spend a half a million dollars plus every year subsidizing their rink. And we don't need that. I mean, we've been doing pretty well and we're very proud of the fact that we pay our bills and we've been doing okay. But, um, you know, we're in uncertain times right now. I'm not quite sure where we're headed, but we're confident that things are going to work out all right. But this could go on for a while. Yeah. I, applaud you. I applaud you for your efforts and, and uh, the you. ability to sustain yourself for, through these times, at least for the time being. Katie, yeah. your hand up. Are there, any, are there any funds coming through from some of the schools or did some of the funds come, you know, on they were expecting to go? Do, do you have any revenue sources from the schools that use your rink? No. No, I didn't think so. Only we, they, we, we rent ice. So the schools don't, the high school does for the varsity boys and girls. Right. And there's youth hockey program, Harwood Youth Hockey. Um, but they pay for ice time. They don't just give us money. It's like they- No, I understand. There's an hourly rate. Yeah. We also rent to Essex Youth Hockey and a lot of other of the youth hockey programs in the region. And then there's these pay to play programs like the Glades and the Flames and whoever. Yeah. I was looking at more anticipatory, you know, they were anticipating, I don't know how your, your payments go. Do they pay in advance or do they pay just, you know, when they use the rink? They pay for hours rented. Hours rented. Right. After, after, after it, right. After the fact. Correct. Okay. Katie, go ahead. Um, I was just going to volunteer as a representative of the municipality. If you, um, if nobody else was interested in that. And I had two questions. One of them is, um, what are you guys running your ice slab temperature at currently? And have you done any other things like shaving down your ice to cut costs of ice maintenance? Yes, we have. We've shaved the ice down. I don't know, I think it's down to about half an inch and they've turned it up to, you guys remember, I think it's like 24 or 25, whatever it is, but it's right, it's five. And it's, it's normally at 22 or something like that. So yeah, that, to try to cut back on the electricity, we're trying to find that line where you can't have it melt and then bleed the paint or, or uh, mess the lines up. So we're right on. And we're also taking the opportunity during this time to do um, training, uh, Zamboni driver training as well with some of our staff. They were doing other maintenance around the rink. The ice is basically soft enough it's too soft to skate on right now, but it's cold enough that it's staying put. Unless we don't want it melting. So you should probably pray for really cold weather and then open the doors. You know, I don't think we <laughs> haven't done that before, too. I was going to ask the same <laughs> question, but I didn't want to be naive. Um, how many employee? How many employees do you have? Um, no full-time employees. We have our rink managers about three-quarter time. Um, we've got a couple other quarter to half time employees, probably 10 to 12, 10 to 12, but some of them are just Samboni drivers that do maybe one shift, two shifts a week, which would be, I don't know what, six, eight hours a week, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, um, the EFUD commissioners meet on Wednesday and this issue is on their agenda as well. Um, you know, I kicked it around. <clears throat> Obviously, EFUD has uh, a little bit bigger vested interest in that they, they've they got money loaned out to the ICE Center. But, <clears throat> you know, the EFUD really is a utility district. It's not a village anymore. It never had recreation. So I think, you know, the, the interests of of the community in terms of getting some community representation on the board. I think a representative from the ICE Center for the purposes, I mean, from the EFUD for the purposes of just kind of keeping a little bit of, uh, you know, information flow going as a, as a note holder, if you will, 
that's really EFUD's interest. I think having a select board member on uh, as a representative working with the board, attending their meetings, it's, you know, the town has recreation as a, um, as uh, one of its missions. Uh, and uh, I've already talked to Nick, the rec director, he'll probably uh, attend some of these meetings just as a representative of staff appointed by me. But I think the, that's the reason why the town should have an interest here is that this is an integral part of the Waterbury recreation scene. And we're fortunate that you know, we're not like Stowe having to sink a half a million dollars of taxpayer money into this and we have it in our community. So uh, I think paying attention to it and understanding the, the needs is worth our while. So Katie, what's your background in the ice business? Are you a uh, skater? Uh, yeah, I've been skating for 22 years. I also okay. figure skated at the ice rink and I think I'm the only member of my family who hasn't served on a board of the ice rink or managed it, so. <laughs> yeah, you ask great questions. Good for you. I wish you guys luck. You are an integral part of the community and it's a real asset to our community, the ice rink. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Anything else? We need to discuss tonight. Thank you guys for coming and, and taking the time. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. You want to formally appoint uh, Katie as the town's liaison to the Ice Center Board of Directors? Sure. Is that is that through a motion? Yeah, I think it would be helpful to do that. So moved. Is there a second? second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much, Katie, for doing that. Thank, Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Happy to have you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Yeah, thank, thanks, everybody, for hanging in there for this long night. I told my wife here, she, out eating dinner before or after, and I said, I better eat it before because I got a feeling it's going to last a little bit into the night. So Thank it's you. It's still kind of early, but appreciate everybody from hanging in there. Well, thanks for having us, and sorry we kept you a little later. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. All right. If no one else has anything else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Sorry, my laptop died earlier. That's why I had to run upstairs. <laughs> motion um, to adjourn. Oh, okay. Oh. All right, Katie. Katie, go ahead. I was going to say, if I don't see you before you depart, um, thank you, Alyssa, for all of your work, and it's been really nice to get to know you and all of your, um, all of your commitment to the town. <laughs> and there she is still there <laughs> she, turned, she turned on <laughs> i would say i'm here i just you can only plug in the ethernet so many places um no really thank you all it's been an honor it's like the perfect first job excited to be a community member and uh share my personal views at meetings so you'll see me around and thank you all for the support there's a little, there's a little party that. on friday as well that uh, you can attend via zoom that our dad was thrown for melissa what time is that at? Four o'clock? I didn't think she knew about it, Mark. You weren't right. It was surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. <laughs> no. Bad toad. <laughs> had it forwarded to me by people other than you. So for the record, this was not a Mark thing. Um, and I think it's Thursday at three, but I've just been told I have a check-in meeting with Karen and Teresa. So if other people were there, um, see yeah, it there. This, right there. This is... This is a surprise, so don't let her know. Mark, we'll make sure to not have you have the town secrets. <laughs> oh, my God. Don't get anything else. It's fine. It, really, it got forwarded to me with, you're leaving, question mark, question mark, question mark. Uh, okay. you, Thank you, you can't all. keep those things secret, that's for sure. I apologize. Uh, no right, well, <laughs> I, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. Second. Good night, all. Thank Have you. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good night.